Well, thanks, Debbie. I've, I, too, have got a lot of mixed emotions about this uh, introduction. Uh, on the one hand, I'm excited about what we're about to hear because in my experience, any time that Dr. Carnes has put significant energies into anything, that first of all, it's brilliant, and second of all, it's uh, personal, and, and, and lastly, it's important. And, uh, and, then, and then secondly, you know, I'm sad. Uh, I'm sad that, uh, that while uh, Dr. Carnes has agreed to do our alumni uh, talks uh, from here on, you know, he's uh, not going to be here in this venue uh, again. And I'm not going to be on campus and turn the corner and bump into him with that look on his face like he's up to something. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's the look right there. Yeah, so, so, you know, before we go on too long and can't get through this thing, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Dr. Patrick Carnes. I believe this moment is difficult for many reasons. Um, I'm aware, first of all, of whenever anything major happens in life, you, you need to stop and acknowledge it because I think many times we breeze through things and don't notice its significance, its importance. And I know that I have done that and that a lot of our ability to experience life is taking the moment to notice what is really going on at the time. What I notice in myself is I feel sad because um, I look at this room and I am flooded with memories. I look across this room and I see people who I've worked with for 10 years. I've rounded the corners and it is true that sometimes I was up to something. I looked at Debbie. She and I have quite a history, and it's not always been easy for either one of us. It was in her office that I r really started to be aware of that and admit to myself there was something really wrong with my wife at that time, and it was the beginning of realizing that a whole new journey was starting for me, and which ended in her death three years ago. I look around the room and I see medical staff. I see faculty from USM who I truly treasure and have been in the trenches with them. Would not have been able to achieve without their brilliant help and friendship. I see alumni who are looking good today, and some of you have driven far to be here. I'm grateful for that. I see patients from all the programs across this wonderful facility. I see people from Next Step I see people from the Women's Center. I see people from the Jellopath program here. So we have new patients who are probably sitting there and wondering what this is all about. And I see staff that I have worked with for a long time. I see people who served and now gone on to other things who've come back to be here for this moment, and I, I noticed that. And I see people from this town. Hattiesburg has been wonderful to me. I remember when I announced that I was coming here and people say, why Hattiesburg? And there were moments that I wondered that at the time, myself. 
but as a community, I have been made to feel very welcome. I see people who, um, when nights were tough for me, I see Bashar from the Walnut Circle Girl and and uh, people from the pastry garden and Jim Hinton and difficult mornings. One of the things I was struck with is that oftentimes when I would stop in a store and people would know who I was, uh, they would take me aside and they say, you know, we're real proud that you're here because we know what you're doing. We take pride that you're here in the city. And I think over the 10 years, we've had some people who sought refuge with us who were very high profile people. And I felt like the people of Hattiesburg kind of surrounded us and helped us protect them and help them. A lot of stories that press never knew about happened because of people in this room. I think it's important to acknowledge that, yes, I'm making a change. It can be as simple as I don't want to travel as much. The other night, after a plane with a flat tire, the Hertz star, uh, stall in which I got into my car and I went to leave and they told me, you're in the wrong car. And it, but it had my name about it, and it was, oh, we made a mistake, but you're still in the wrong car, so I had to unload everything and reload it. And <coughs> by the end of the day, I said, I don't want to do this anymore. See, I'm 69, going to be 70, and it's harder. It takes more to stay healthy. And um, I am aware that at this time of my life, I really want to spend more time with my family. And I'm also aware that um, I have been blessed in my life, and I have deep, deep, great gratitude for that this morning, for being given meaningful work and I want to finish it. And that's going to take time, and it means stopping a lot of what I do. And one of the things that I can say to you is that, <clears throat> you know, the wisdom researchers, actually there are researchers who research wisdom, which is an interesting body of literature. <clears throat> and there's a, a school of thought called the Berlin School of Wisdom. And they say that the human brain reaches its epitome at the age of 65. And I'm still waiting for the surge because it hasn't hit me yet. But I'll tell you what I have learned is, is that <clears throat> when I was 30 and I th thought of myself at 15, and what did I know? Well, I thought I knew more than I did. When I was 50 and looked at myself when I was 30, mm, no, not good. And um, that process continues. Looking at 70 and at the age of 65, um, almost dying myself from valley fever, and then watching Susie die, 
it, it shifts how you look at things. Because it seems in my life that you constantly are having to let go of stuff. It's always changing. And as those losses increase, what you realize is that you don't want to put any time into anything unless it's important. And I look back at things that I thought I knew at 65, and having experienced those things, I realized as a man at 65, I still had a lot of growing up to do. And it took a lot of pain for me to understand things about myself that I deeply regret. But I can still fix and be better. And one of those things is keeping my focus on the things that are important. And that means also letting go, almost always the choice. Those of us who get into the situation, and Mandy Pausch talks about it in his book, The Last Lecture, which I have been rereading, and he talks about it. It's like you have to have a Dutch uncle in your head who speaks realistically to you and says, what are you willing to give up in order to do this? And sometimes the things you have to give up are very painful. I have loved my life here, and I hate giving it up. They say that relationships, including marriages, are struggles. It's finding the best struggle you can. I've had some of the best people to struggle with here. And I think what is important to understand is not that I'm just leaving or that I'm affiliated with another institution or whatever. What I wanted to tell you about is why I think what we do is matters. And I'll start with an event that happened about five, six years ago. And some of you know that I have a pension for old motors and cars, and boats, and you've seen some of those things floating around. If some of you are smiling at me, I know what you're thinking. It's, some people think that I'm a bit compulsive about this and that even, there's a term, I like to restore old outboard motors and the term compulsive outboardism has used, been used in this audience and I want to assure you there is no such illness. <laughs> But I believe old things speak to us. The further down the road I get, I'm just very aware of that what I think wisdom a lot is, is noticing where energy is. So I would go to work out in the morning over in Pedal. And I noticed an old car in a field 57 DeSoto. And yeah, just sitting out there. So I stopped my car one morning and I went to look at it. Turns out it's a cop car. Turns out it's the sheriff's car. And I think of 1957, that, that automobile belonged to the sheriff of Forest County when Mississippi was burning. 
If ever there was an historical piece of equipment, what stories it would have to tell. I found the woman who owned it, and I bought the car. And at that time, Susie was alive. I called my friend Ralph. And he says, time for disclosure. He says, remember, faster, better. So I called her and I told her I bought a police car that morning. My goal is, with that car, and I'm going to need some help with it, but it, to get it restored. And my intent was to, to raise money for addiction research with it. But also, I believe that car needs to stay here. I, need that, I, th I think that car needs to be here because it is a concrete symbol of how far we have come. If you think of the late 50s and what we were concerned about at that time, and the ability to transcend that and move ahead is an extraordinary part of the story of this country. I believe in things like that. And we can't let that go. I won't let that go. Because I believe it's about a fight against prejudice. And I believe that's the fight that we are in right now. Some time back, I was interviewed by a very famous woman reporter. You all probably have seen her, Leslie Stahl, on 48 Hours. You've seen her. And <clears throat> Leslie says, I got some questions about sex addiction I'd like to ask you. Could we spend some time together? And so I sit in an office, camera crews who flew in, she's sitting there all put together, dressed for the occasion. And the first 10 minutes, kind of low-hanging fruit, easy things for me to answer. And then she says to me, and you know, for, uh, people in 48 hours, as wonderful as they are, are not above ambushing. <laughs> and one of the things she said, you know, there's a famous person who has gone through treatment and this is now three years later is in a lot of trouble and it's in the news and so her question to me she said you know about this situation I said I've heard about it she said well went through treatment and now is in trouble, doesn't this prove that treatment does not work? I said, Leslie, do you have a copy of the discharge summary? She says, what's that? And I said, it's a list at the end of treatment that is given to that person about the things that have to happen over the two or three years in order to maintain the momentum that they got when they were in treatment. Everybody gets one. Do you have a copy? Knowing full well, she could never have a copy of that. She says, well, I don't have that. And I says, so then you don't know, and in addition, you don't know if, she, if that person did everything that those professionals said would going to be required in order for her to change her life. She says, no, I don't know that. And I think in there is the problem. Because the prejudice is, is that addiction and mental health is not treatable. 
and the media is part of that. The story was, is that the people, those people who drove miles to get here, who are alumni that have put together successful recoveries, is something the media would not believe. Untreatable, too damaged. There's a picture I have that was painted in the early 19th century in England of the royal court, king and queen and nobility on a Sunday afternoon going through the insane asylum because part of Sunday afternoons was to visit the insane asylum to look at the inmates for amusement. And yet when I go by the checkout stand in the grocery store and I look at various magazines, Inquirer or what have you, it's all about people failing. My God, she's back in treatment for her eating disorder. My God, he, how many times does someone have to go through treatment before they get it? You know what happens to famous people when they go to treatment and why it's so hard for them? One of the reasons it's difficult, you take like a band leader or a sports figure or a CEO, people of achievement. They have people around them who if they stop work, the money stops. If that band leader has got a European tour scheduled, there's a lot of people whose income are now dependent upon him immediately going back out and doing that, even though on the discharge summary it will say, <laughs> you need to go to more extended care, you need to take a year off, you need to do these things, because you're gonna need time. You've got the money, you don't have to do the work, but as soon as they get out of treatment, their handlers start to whisper, you can't afford to do this. Those psychologists, those psychiatrists don't, they live in another world. You're in the real world now. And the real world is, you gotta go do this, because if you don't, so-and-so is gonna beat you out and your career is going to go down the tubes. That's what happens. So, there is an image out there about mental health. And if I step back for a moment, I think it's worse than that. I don't think we've changed. I think our media is just like the king and queen walking through the insane asylum. We're doing the same thing. Now, the fact is, is that we are in a country that is in a lot of trouble. First of all, because we have set ourselves up as a prototype of what all future nations should be like. We're the democracy. And the successful democracy exporting its various things like McDonald's and what have you, but also attitudes and technology. But we're in a very unique spot right now, which involves this question about whether mental health is treatable. It's probably the biggest moment in the history of our species. I've been reading a book called The Last, State, Last Ape Standing. Turns out that there were 27 different 
types of ancestors we could have had that could have been Homo sapiens eventually. The one that did it, <coughs> very interesting story because there probably were very few of them at the time because of a worldwide cataclysm that reduced their population to very few in numbers. One of the ways we know that is we, we all do carry the genes of one woman. And the author's point is that the only way that it got to be anything is that the human brain got to the point <clears throat> where it, it exceeded 900 cc's in volume. And there were different things that created that. Interestingly enough, cooking food changed enzymes. Music changed how the brain functioned. In other words, over time, there were things that occurred, but the fact of the matter that we are here as a species is because our brains expanded and altered in a way where we could solve problems. It's the only way that we were able to do it. We did it better than the other ones. Now what the author suggests is that we're in a very unique position because he takes the position that this is the first time in our history as a species that we will watch maybe evolution actually happen in front of our very eyes. And the reason? Digital stimulation of the brain. Now how do I recognize that in my own life? I have 10 grandchildren. My four-year-old looks at me struggling with my iPhone and he says, here grandpa, let me fix that for you. <laughs> Takes it, there you go. Now. I remember just learning how to write on a computer was a big deal. I'm watching what he does, I can't do it. And it's not just reading the manual. It's not. Because kids at this point in time are so immersed in digitalization And what happens is that when they do those things, it stimulates the synaptic growth of the brain. And what's becoming very clear is that their brains are going to be different than our brains. 